Um, thank you for being here um, at 10 a.m. on a Monday morning, which I always find challenging. I don't, I don't know about the rest of you. Uh, I'm Olga Oliker. I direct the Russia and Eurasia program here at CSIS. And before we get started, just want to make a quick uh, administrative announcement. Um, you've all seen the exit signs. If uh, any emergency occurs, uh, please listen, listen to me to tell you what, uh, what our instructions are, if any. Probably there will be some. Um, I am extremely uh, happy to uh, be hosting this panel discussion today on um, Russian nuclear, the future of Russian nuclear weapons and Russian nuclear strategy. We have um, truly an all-star panel. Uh, the two uh, the two panelists I have here. Uh, each individually, separately, um, and literally has written the book on uh, Russian nuclear weapons. Uh, Pavel Podvig, uh, currently an independent analyst based in Geneva, is, uh, you know him from his uh, Russian nuclear forces blog, uh, which I know I cite uh, roughly twice a day, and is really one of the best uh, sources of information on what's going on with Russian strategic nuclear forces. Um, he has been uh, working on arms control since his days in Moscow at the Center for Arms Control Studies at the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, and uh, since then has been at uh, Princeton, MIT, and Stanford, uh, and now is in, as I said, in Geneva, where he's, uh, in addition to his uh, independent research, he's a senior research fellow at the UN Institute for Disarmament Research. Um, Nikolai Sokov is a senior fellow at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. Um, he has worked on uh, nuclear weapons uh, also for a very long time. He has been a negotiator for Russia on START I and START II, and he was in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs there. Um, and uh, he, his, uh, he has a PhD from the University of Michigan um, and uh, another from the Institute of World Economy and International Relations. Um, I'm going to ask Pavel and Nikolai each to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, um, and uh, then maybe I'll say a few words, and then we'll open up the floor for discussions. Uh, I'm glad to see so many of you here. There's, uh, there's one seat up front here if people are coming in and looking for a spot, and another over here. But um, So come on, don't be shy. Uh, but first, uh, I think let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Pavel. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming in today. Uh, I hope this will be an interesting discussion. So what I will uh, try to do, I will talk mostly about the uh, strategic modernization effort that is going on in Russia and what is sort of behind it and uh, uh, where does it leave us uh, as far as the prospects of arms control are, are, are concerned. So uh, to start, uh, I, I hope, uh, I'm sure you know the general outline that uh, Russia is undertaking a fairly uh, ambitious uh, uh, strategic modernization program. Uh, it works to uh, build a new, uh, pretty much each leg of its strategic triad. Uh, there are several uh, ICBM projects in the development, uh, the Topolem, silo and road based. Uh, there is a new heavy, uh, "Quote unquote ICBM Sarmat. Uh, there is a missile that R RS-26 that Russia declared uh, ICBM, but it may be an intermediate range missile. There is this rail mobile ICBM project that is going on and off. So uh, only just in uh, missiles, uh, there is a lot of activity there. Uh, then of course uh, there is a program to build a new uh, strategic submarines. Uh, there is work uh, that is done on uh, new strategic, new production of all strategic bombers, and there is also a project to build a new uh, strategic bomber known as PAC-DA. Uh, and we've seen that Russia has uh, deployed and actually tested in combat uh, a new uh, air-launched cruise missile, uh, <coughs> KH-101, and. Uh, the conventional one apparently was tested, and it it is deploying it. It's sort of feeding it on uh, old uh, older strategic bombers. So, in addition to that, in addition to the strategic triad, there is a uh, there is a lot of activity in sort of supporting uh, programs. Uh, there is a 
very substantial effort to uh, improve uh, the early warning system. The network of early warning radars is actually is about to be completed, or at least it is uh, at very advanced stages uh, of a deployment. Uh, then there is a project that uh, launch uh, builds uh, wants to build a new. A <coughs> constellation of early warning satellites. One satellite is in orbit, and uh, that's, uh, that work will uh, continue. Uh, there is an effort to build, uh, to build the uh, command and control communication system. Again, there we hear here and there about the fourth generation, fifth generation, things like that. So that's, uh, uh, there, there is uh, quite a bit of activity there. Uh, then uh, there are what I, uh, would call non-strategic and exotic projects. Uh, non-strategic is uh, probably one of the most interesting developments is this new cruise missile uh, caliber that was again demonstrated in combat in Syria last fall. Uh, and uh, so far it will be deployed on uh, su submarines and surface ships. Uh, my suspicion that this is the missile that raised uh, questions with the INF Treaty. We'll maybe talk about this later. Uh, then there are all these kind of uh, <coughs> exotic projects, uh, these hypersonic glider, the project uh, 4202, uh, which uh, is has uh, undergoing flight tests. Uh, there is an uh, anti-satellite project. Uh, and then you may remember there was this kind of a made a wave, uh, what's the status six, this massive underwater drone uh, or something that looked like that, uh, that Russia seems maybe developing. Well, again, we could talk. So there is a, there is a lot of activity. And then you, uh, you may actually, looking at that, uh, the natural question is sort of what's, uh, what are they up to, so what's, what's going on? Uh, and uh, my answer is actually, well, maybe not very much uh, is behind that. Uh, one fundamental thing, of course, is that this is, a, a, in essence, this is a normal generational change. Uh, the old systems uh, are getting old. Uh, they need to be replaced. Uh, and that actually uh, what's behind uh, the the core of this uh, of this program. And uh, if you think about it, most of the, uh, for example, uh, most of the ICBMs that are currently deployed, they actually were uh, deployed in the uh, late seventies, early eighties. So uh, they, they are like really old. Uh, well, uh, there are, there were newer systems as well, but uh, you, you get you get the idea. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, although it does seem this kind of list of systems does seem impressive, uh, if you look at specific projects, uh, most of them are actually going very slowly and uh, years be are years behind the schedule and probably over the budget too. Uh, the Bulova uh, SLBM program comes uh, to mind. Of course, uh, there were numerous delays with, uh, with the, for example, the early warning satellites, and uh, uh, there are a number of programs like that. Uh, there, some, of them, some of the programs are actually more successful than others. Uh, for example, the radars, the early warning radars are, seem to be going very well. Uh, but in general, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a long kind of slog. Uh, there is nothing kind of a sudden about this uh, modernization or there is no uh, uh, kind of concentrated effort, if you will. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I think it, it is important to keep in mind that uh, there are a few core programs that actually uh, feed into this kind of a generational change pattern uh, and mainly the uh, the ICBMs, uh, the solid propellant Topol M and Yars uh, ICBMs, and or these submarines, uh, and then there is a lot of uh, kind of activity around that may not nece necessarily have a clear purpose. Uh, in, for example, and these are what I would call uh, kind of opportunistic programs. Uh, uh, what happens is that if uh, 
if you look at the uh, way uh, the military industry uh, is managed and has been managed in the Soviet Union and uh, it is managed uh, how it is managed today, uh, you will see the way it works uh, is that the, the industry is coming up with the, its own kind of a pet projects and lobby uh, for this or, or that. And uh, in, the, uh, in the, I would say, total absence of, of a discussion of what it is that is really necessary, uh, you get this kind of Wild West competition and people who could present their project in a more po most positive way, they get uh, kind of a support and funding uh, and they, uh, if they could do the job, they get kind of more support and uh, funding. So, for example, uh, and uh, they take this heavy, heavy ICBM, sort of, what's the purpose of this program? I, I'm not sure that uh, it's, uh, there, there, there is a clear purpose, not to mention that the program will probably be uh, totally ineffective from the cost point of view. They are planning to deploy uh, less than, uh, fewer than uh, 50 missiles, uh, and if you factor in development cost and everything, I, I think it just, uh, it's, a very, it's going to be a very expensive program. Uh, or, but at the same time, you could see uh, easily how the, uh, the the argument is made that the uh, whatever it is now that uh, Politburo uh, replaces uh, Politburo, the, uh, the meeting at the Security Council or uh, at the Putin uh, roundtable, that oh, this is a missile that we have to have this missile because we need to do something about missile defense, and that's kind of thing. Uh, that kind of argument uh, wins and eventually the program gets uh, what it wants. So, uh, so, as I say, so just to, again, emphasize the point, uh, again, my st strong feeling uh, as I've been looking at the uh, weapon developments back in the Soviet time and uh, in, in, in Russia today, uh, that uh, a lot of these programs may not have a clear purpose or a strategic mission, or they are just uh, done because, well, wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be nice to have a hypersonic glider? Well, maybe that's sort of, uh, so, uh, and uh, as long as the money is there, that, uh, that, that would continue. And you, will, you, you have seen, uh, I guess, that uh, it's very difficult to cut off the funding uh, and uh, because the, the, the military industrial complex, uh, uh, especially in the Soviet and Russian circumstances, becomes a force that is really hard to uh, counter. And not to mention that there is no uh, public or non-public discussion of these issues. It's really, uh, it's really sort of in terms of uh, decision making, it's back, I think, to Khrushchev's time, not even the kind of a more orderly uh, Brezhnev, uh, Brezhnev's era. So, uh, still, I think uh, for these arguments, uh, sort of for people to make various arguments, uh, you, they, they have to have some kind of a purpose in mind. They have to have uh, uh, argue something. And uh, I think, again, uh, fundamentally, uh, as far as I can tell, the general idea of nuclear weapons in the Russian leadership and the, uh, is that uh, there is one kind of simple question. Does Russia or does it not have a credible retaliatory capability? So can Russia respond if someone attacks it? And that's, so as long as you sort of, you, if you are a, uh, the uh, <coughs> defense industry uh, person, as long as you sort of present your project as helping this particular purpose, then you are, you are in business. Uh, and uh, what is important though, that uh, this general uh, kind of a idea of credible capability uh, or has to be credible. So this is why uh, missile defense is a very touchy subject uh, and or things like high precision strike, conventional strike, 
uh, y again, if you if you sit down and kind of do the the calculation, do do the analysis, uh, I think it is clear that none none of those, neither missile defense nor conventional forces, pose any particular threat uh, to Russian forces. Uh, but it's an easy argument to make. So we we need to maintain the credible capability. This is why missile defense is such a such a danger. So uh, I'll leave Nikolai uh, to talk about the kind of a strategy uh, and uh, because I think he has a very interesting uh, very interesting take on that uh, I would just uh, say that in my understanding Russia does not necessarily have a specific kind of a nuclear strategy sort of employing its nuclear forces uh, because uh, the basic it does have it probably does have a strategy, a general uh, strategy, uh, military or political, that relies on the presence uh, on the capability of its strategic arsenal, sort of. And the, so the strategic forces uh, play a role of kind of a supporting uh, whatever decisions and moves uh, Russia may, uh, may take, be that a uh, situation like Ukraine uh, or any some some other conflict, uh, and in my view, that uh, sort of if you think about that, uh, it probably worked fairly well uh, in Ukraine uh, from this uh, point of view. I think it wasn't an accident that Putin actually openly said that he considered putting uh, nuclear forces on alert during the Crimea operation. Uh, because the signal is there is very clear uh, that if you you don't want to get involved in any kind of a conflict with Russia uh, because that may put you on a path to a situation where nuclear weapons may be a part of the equation nobody's saying that they will be or that they but even the thought of some kind of a development they that may end up in the nuclear domain uh, in today's circumstances that uh, turns to be enough to uh, give a lot of people in the West kind of a pause and think, well, do we really think that the stakes are that high? And I think uh, to, to some extent, uh, this kind of a playing up the nuclear component of the, of, 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 uh, of the of various conflicts, uh, that, that's, I think, a deliberate policy on, on part of the Russian leadership and uh, precisely because uh, they they do feel that uh, nobody wants to go there, and as long as nobody does, then uh, they are fairly safe, sort of, to operate in on the on the kind of a Ukraine type level. So, and uh, finally, uh, let me uh, say a couple of words about the prospects for arms control. Uh, although there are there are few, as you would probably understand. Uh, understand. Uh, one biggest problem uh, that if we are looking at these kind of strategic uh, arms control, the new start, follow on uh, kind of development, uh, one of the biggest problems uh, getting that agreement is that uh, the numbers, they don't really matter much or at all, uh, particularly in, in Russia. So the offer of get, getting a new agreement with say 1,000 uh, strategic warheads doesn't doesn't really change anything. So, uh, for from the point of view of Russia, uh, and because of various things, uh, partly because the Russians they do believe that the United States could uh, probably double or triple the number of deployed warheads in a very short period of time, which it actually can. So, uh, this. What Russia is interested in, uh, I guess, uh, my strong feeling is that uh, that the any new agreement would have to include uh, some kind of limits on missile defense or conventional capabilities uh, and uh, things like that. Uh, and that sort of gives uh, some of, the, of an opening, uh, I guess, uh, some, some of a hope for arms control because uh, this is where uh, you see that a threat of the, the first, the New Star Treaty actually does all this. The New Star Treaty has a weak, but 
it has the language that links uh, strategic defense and offense. Uh, it has, uh, it doesn't, it's, it does address the issue of uh, strategic systems with conventional warheads. They are all counted as nuclear. So the, the new STAR Treaty sort of has this framework that, uh, that talks about these issues. So uh, if the United States uh, were to say, okay, uh, we, if you don't want to have a new agreement uh, with a thousand warhead limit, uh, we will go to 1,000 unilaterally, but you will lose all these kind of links that are in the new start. I think that would be enough to get kind of Russia's attention, and uh, Russia, in my view, would be interested to keeping uh, the basic uh, new start uh, architecture in force and uh, having this kind of, as I say, the foot in the door on the issue of missile defense and uh, uh, things like uh, conventional, uh, conventionally armed strategic missiles. Uh, so the simple solution here uh, for the start follow-on is a, a start follow-on. You have the new start treaty, you just change one number or three numbers for that matter. Instead of uh, 50 and 50 deployed warheads, you go to 1,000 warheads and just don't touch anything else. And that should, uh, I think that should be enough. There is one uh, little thing that gets a lot of attention, the, those hypersonic gliders. Uh, I think it would be reasonable uh, to have them included, sort of have an understanding to include these systems uh, in the limits uh, as well, because uh, that, that would be a good thing to do. So, uh, and finally, I have literally a minute. Uh, let me uh, touch briefly on the INF treaty dispute, because I think it is important, as, as I guess, uh, we all understand that there is no way any new treaty would be possible unless this, this controversy is uh, resolved. Uh, one thing, uh, we, we don't know apparently what's the, what's the substance of the U.S. allegations, or at least we don't know that for, for certain. Uh, and the Russians say they don't know it either. Uh, my strong suspicion is that this is the uh, caliber type missile that was just launched from a the kind of a treaty non-compliant launcher, uh, but the administration is forceful that this is not the case. Well, I still keep my uh, take on that uh, sort of. Uh, but uh, I think that the current, the U.S. position is not actually very productive because uh, yes, it is reasonable from to say that, well, we, wait, we are waiting for Russia to kind of uh, confess. Uh, uh, but at the same time, if you look at the uh, Russia's counter allegations, uh, some of them have been discussed, like these test missiles and everything, they were, uh, it's, uh, it's, they already been discussed. But one, this, uh, this issue with this launcher, these, the launchers, the MK41, MK uh, Russia actually has a point there and I think that the, the current U.S. position is actually not very helpful uh, because basically it boils down to trust us, these launchers are good, uh, which is okay, uh, but that's not how the treaty works. Uh, there should be what they call observable differences, so it shouldn't be a problem. It, it is probably, but it shouldn't be problem. And, uh, and technically, I'm not a lawyer, but as far as I can tell, actually, the, uh, the deployment of these systems uh, does not actually contradict the letter of the treaty. So the, the United States has a fairly strong position there to defend that. So I don't see any harm in actually uh, uh, openly telling Russia that, okay, uh, you have questions about these kind of missile defense launchers. Uh, we are going to discuss them openly, and uh, we are ready to uh, admit that. Uh, the U.S. administration representatives uh, say that that's actually what they've done, uh, but I don't think that's actually that's the case. There, there, there has to be a strong, open statement that the United States is willing to discuss uh, Russia's uh, uh, concerns. Uh, knowing full well that there are, again, as I said, there is no, uh, the U.S. is fully compliant with the letter of the treaty and uh, that there is, shouldn't be a problem there. 
Uh, and uh, that may put us on the way uh, of resolving the, uh, the uh, <coughs> Russian controversy. And I, I, I would just repeat again, in my view, observable differences is the key, uh, two key words uh, for resolving this whole mess. And uh, I hope that we'll get there. Thank you. Uh, Pavel, thank you so much. I thought that was a fantastic overview of both where the Russian program is going and uh, what that might mean for arms control. And I look forward to unpacking this uh, some more in the discussion. But first, uh, I want to ask Nikolai to give uh, his presentation on what the Russians are thinking uh, they're doing with uh, this arsenal. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the keyboard here. Uh, oh, yeah, it does work. Great, wonderful. Yeah. So, so, so anyway, yes, that's the first slide. Anyway, so everything's fine. Um, uh, so those who look already heard me before uh, speaking, they know that I stutter. Uh, yes, I stuttered since I was a very small child. Yes, I decided to fight then. Uh, that. Uh, when I became like a student like at Moscow State University, uh, so yes, I forced myself to speak at each seminar, I have not been able to stop since. So yes, I'm very sorry <laughs> if I talk too much. So anyway, uh, the Russian nuclear strategy, uh, the transition uh, it actually did not happen when the Soviet Union ended. Uh, the transition uh, took place almost uh, 10 years later, and that was specifically related uh, to the war in Kosovo, a major turning point in the Russian on national security policy, in uh, the world view, uh, like and everything uh, that you can imagine. The biggest thing about the war in Kosovo was that it was not authorized by the UN Security Council. Uh, so the use of force there was actually not legal. Um, oh, so in terms of the international uh, law, uh, so uh, in March 99, uh, the fighting in Kosovo was still actually going on. The Security Council assembles. Uh, the first meeting actually chaired by Putin, by the way, who just became uh, the Secretary of the Security Council and commissions a new military strategy to handle uh, what they saw as a major change in the international relations. One year later, uh, national security concept and military doctrine. The military doctrine uh, did get kind of fine-tuned for another uh, four years. Uh, by the end of 2003, basically, we had it all stabilized. Uh, so is that's kind of like a bit of a history. So what, uh, oh yeah. So uh, the biggest change that came uh, the transition from the Soviet Union to Russia, uh, basically uh, we saw a new mission. So yes, that's the big thing. The military doctrine classified four types of military conflicts. Uh, under the Soviet kind of classification, uh, nuclear weapons would have been assigned only uh, to the global conflict, basically to World War III. In 2000, a new type of mission emerged. Uh, that's regional conflict. Uh, yes, regional conflict is limited kind of goals, uh, but with participation of major powers. Uh, uh, so please uh, pay attention to the date, 99, 2000. Everyone knew that the second war in Chechnya might actually happen. Uh, so uh, the big concern was that the United States would actually like, interfere, uh, same they did in Kosovo, uh, over Chechnya. Uh, so uh, basically the main mission was uh, to prevent such interference. Uh, yes, and in fact from here you actually get the term uh, de-escalation. We all know that Russia has got the de-escalation strategy. Yes, and Russia always says we do not have a de-escalation strategy, which is technically right. They do not have the term. Yes, I frankly just like the term that was used in one of the military publications back in 99. It officially it doesn't exist, but, uh, but the origins of the term are you know, actually there. Uh, so what's the big kind of change? And here is a table that summarizes uh, uh, the changes. So for the Soviet and uh, uh, so uh, for the Soviet Union and the Russian uh, 93 military doctrine, the very first one on nuclear weapons are assigned only to global war. 
in 2000 and uh, uh, the subsequent doctrines, we see uh, a new category, uh, uh, a new class of conflict to which nuclear weapons are assigned. Uh, in terms of a mission, uh, the old doctrine, basically, you deter World War III, uh, but for uh, uh, the new doctrine, uh, Oh, you got the second mission, as I said, uh, de-escalating uh, the regional war through the threat of limited use of nuclear weapons. So yes, you got limited use. You got oh, military targets for oh, oh, limited use. Not a massive all-out strike, but very, very small, very limited, and limited to actually military targets. And the first use that was introduced in 93, it's really funny, just as an aside. Like in 92, I did actually argue for the first use, but the Ministry of Defense said, no, no, no way, that's way too big, that's bad. So in 92, the military actually advocated keeping the no first use, but they did change the view one year later. But that was already in Michigan, so. Uh, that, was, <laughs> that was not me. Uh, so the Soviet Union like, always just advocated massive strike like, on warning. That was the key mode for deterrence. They did try to transition uh, to clear-cut second strike, but oh, oh, R&D uh, did not catch up like, in time. So basically, the Soviet Union was supposed to transition fully to second strike sometime like, in the 90s, but yes, then no money. The country broke apart. So. Uh, that was not completed. Um, Moscow basically is trying to do the same. I'm not really sure they got second strike right now, but that's debatable. And finally, the scale of use. Uh, uh, during the Cold War, yes, it was like unacceptable damage. Yes, what's unacceptable? Well, no one really knows what's unacceptable, but, uh, but that's a lot. Uh, uh, oh, look, under 2000, we got tailored. And we all remember uh, that the previous administration, the George W. Bush administration, uh, came up with the term uh, uh, tailored uh, deterrence, uh, but actually, look in Russia, they used the word tailored like a few years sooner. Um, so once again, yeah, oh, oh, no, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, so how does it actually work? Uh, well, nothing too actually fascinating, nothing too fancy. Uh, the biggest kind of part of the de-escalation concept is um, that notion of a symmetry of stakes. The likely like a symmetry of stakes. Uh, just imagine, I don't know Chechnya, just imagine South Ossetia, like anything. Uh, so, the, uh, so, so the perception is the United States will go like, around using force um, so, uh, to promote democracy and human rights. Democracy and human rights are very nice things, uh, uh, but they're not really worth even like a single nuclear uh, explosion. So if you can th uh, credibly say uh, you mess with us and you'll have five, eight, ten nuclear like, explosions, well, the United States will probably refrain from protecting democracy and stuff like that. So, uh, so that's basically roughly, I'll, I'll cynically, kind of the logic behind that. Uh, the logic itself is absolutely not new. Fundamentally, we're talking about going back to going back into the 50s and 60s, so, uh, so uh, to flexible deterrence to NSC. So, uh, 68 and other uh, very, very well-known concepts. So that's kind of interesting because the Soviet Union, until the last days, the Soviet Union really like, adhered to very simple, very primitive, uh, I would say, uh, logics of nuclear deterrence. Uh, to a large extent, all the conceptual work that was done within the military and think tanks uh, did not really get to uh, at uh, the top level, yes, and I got lots of evidence to support that. Uh, so like officially, it all remained very simple, kind of a um, massive strike. What happened like, in the 90s and subsequently is that uh, uh, the Russian military basically uh, went to basics, uh, went uh, back to basics, uh, like, and designed the strategy that's a simplified actually version of what happened there. Uh, so yes, that's why I got Paul Nietzsche, that's why I got 
uh, Tom Schelling. And the document there in the middle is a 62, uh, on 1962 document that was declassified in late 90s, fascinating reading. Uh, but that's really more or less the logic that you can see right now in Russia. Um, Taylor damage, yes, suddenly we sharp. Uh, just exactly commensurate to the level, to the scale of threat. So very few, once again, not too many. Uh, the picture on the left actually made it myself. That's just uh, to remind everyone that when we talk about the red button, uh, that's the American thing. <laughs> yes, in Russia, it's light gray. <laughs> OK, so just uh, uh, so when we see the buttons being pushed, uh, 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 they can really safely claim they don't push the red button. Twenty ten. Uh, quite an interesting actual debate happened in two thousand nine. Uh, the new edition of the military doctrine was supposed to uh, be issued in two thousand nine. Uh, look, it got delayed. Uh, quite an interesting actual controversy uh, uh, that actually partially got into the open. Uh, some people decided uh, to expand uh, the nuclear mission further uh, to local conflict. Local conflict is basically 2008 uh, Georgia war. It would have been uh, uh, quite actually crazy uh, to expand the nuclear mission to that class of conflicts. Is an after some debate, that proposal was abandoned, was rejected. Uh, so, uh, the missions remained the same. The only thing that happened in 2010 is actually uh, they established a somewhat higher threshold uh, to use nuclear weapons, which was a positive development. Uh, well, that everyone mostly missed. And finally, uh, uh, the latest edition, 2014, um, I think nuclear uh, strategy has not changed at all. So basically, we can say that uh, by 2010, uh, the nuclear strategy has stabilized. And, uh, well, it remains more or less the same uh, as of today, so six years later. Uh, the new big development in 2014 was the introduction of conventional deterrence. Uh, so, yes, that was the big change. Um, and once again, no one really paid too much attention to that at that point. I think we now know better after uh, the calibers that were used in Syria and stuff like that. So when I talk about limited strike, uh, if you actually look at public reports about large-scale maneuvers that included simulated nuclear strikes, you could actually get kind of more or less the range of targets uh, that they had in mind for uh, the limited use. And I would say two very interesting things uh, from that list. One, the targets are military. Uh, um, who was it? Uh, uh, General, uh, 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 yeah, I think, uh, uh, oh, 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 Clark, uh, who said about the notional Warsaw. Yeah, I think that was a big mistake. Uh, yes, if we talk about using a nuclear weapon like on a limited scale, that's really military targets, not cities. The second, Quite interesting uh, thing is that uh, the targets are basically the bases or the assets, the platforms uh, that might be used in a Kosovo-style conventional uh, attack on Russia. So basically, uh, we fly uh, B-2s uh, from the United States. Uh, these bases will going to be targets uh, flying oh, oh, missions from Oh, with aircraft carriers, yes, that's the targets, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's really interesting, very fascinating. Uh, one debatable kind of point, and I think that Pavel might actually disagree with me. Uh, well, it's really hard to, to be final uh, look on that. I think that uh, this very traditional now, since 99, uh, 
our West 2013 exercise was the first one that did not include simulated nuclear strikes. Uh, so by the end of 2013, I believe, uh, Moscow decided that, well, it no longer needs to rely as much on nuclear weapons. But of course, one year later, in 2014, uh, the next West uh, exercise uh, 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 did include simulated nuclear strikes. Um, so quite a fascinating kind of thing. Uh, oops. Uh, so what do we talk about here? How do we like, assess nuclear strategy? Actually, that's a very limited kind of thing. Fundamentally, you can say uh, that greater reliance on nuclear weapons simply resulted from the, uh, the fact that nuclear weapons are the only asset that Russia does have uh, that's tangible, that's credible, something they have in their hands. Uh, but uh, look, in today's world, relying on nuclear weapons is not a very productive thing to do. Uh, nuclear weapons are just way too powerful. Uh, uh, the stigma is way too high. You cannot uh, threaten them against non-nuclear states. And if you cannot um, make a threat, then uh, what's the use of them? Uh, and the vast majority of contingencies where you might actually need to rely on military power, uh, yes, you cannot use nuclear weapons for these contingencies. So that's kind of uh, the big limitation uh, that was, I think, understood from the very beginning. And please, let us not forget that 2003, uh, that latest like iteration of the first uh, military doctrine, very, very clearly said, uh, 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 that we rely on nuclear weapons only like, until such time as we can um, um, modernize conventional capability. So from the very beginning, reliance on nuclear weapons was seen as a temporary fix. Uh, now the big question about Ukraine. So yes, I try to be academic here and simply said that the case of Ukraine is not conclusive. Yes, I would say my personal view is that nuclear weapons did not actually uh, figure like in the Ukraine crisis at all. And that's my personal view. Uh, you could not see any change in posture. Uh, you cannot see any uh, change in uh, uh, the operation of nuclear forces except for flights of strategic bombers are uh, something that could be done on the cheap. You saw a lot of rhetoric uh, uh, that invoked nuclear weapons uh, during the Ukraine crisis, uh, but well, in my view, actually, uh, these statements, these references to nuclear weapons were mostly directed at the domestic audience, at the population, basically saying, uh, don't worry, guys. No one's going to touch us. Yes, it's not like a war, yes, and we can prevent the outside interference, uh, sleep tight. We've got nuclear weapons, yes, and that's the best thing to have. Uh, yes, and here you just really need to look, understand the psychological dimension of this whole thing. Uh, generally speaking, Russians love nuclear weapons. <laughs> that's a very nice thing to have. Uh, it's a very deep kind of psychological connection there. Uh, uh, some people would say you cannot sleep well uh, like if you've got nuclear weapons around. I think like in Russia, for the vast majority of population, it's the opposite. You can sleep tight as long as you've got nuclear weapons. If you don't have nuclear weapons, uh, that's when you lose sleep. Uh, so I think uh, all the kind of the rhetoric there like about nuclear weapons really kind of was mostly directed at the public. Uh, can nuclear weapons work like as a cover, like as a protection uh, for low level oh, expansion? Um, yeah, but you don't need a de-escalation or anything else. Uh, basically, any nuclear weapons uh, can do that. For Russia, the United States, UK, anyone. Yeah, and maybe they don't actually work. So yes, anyway, look, got the very best evidence, I think, is inconclusive, but I think that they did, did not feature. So the new variable, conventional long-range capability, 
calibers from Caspian Sea, calibers from uh, um, um, Mediterranean, and new outcomes. Um, uh, that's a big actually change, well, not change, the big difference from the United States. Uh, here, uh, the acquisition of long-range conventional capability actually led uh, to reduce reliance on nuclear weapons. I think in Russia, uh, it does not. It complements the nuclear capability. What we have is a new step, like in that, so a de-escalation ladder. Uh, look. Uh, the assets are actually dual capable, as Pavel um, mentioned that. Uh, so you can go conventional, or if necessary, you can go nuclear. So, uh, uh, you got well, basically full capability there. Uh, is I cannot talk too much about that, don't have time, isn't that's the, not the topic, but I think that's actually the most fascinating aspect, the most fascinating new development. Let me say just one thing, is and if you want, uh, <laughs> To take something out of my talk, that's actually rather the thing yes, I'd, uh, I'd like you to take. Uh, that's a sea change. Uh, that's a massive fundamental change in the international system. Because starting with the first war in the Gulf, 91, the United States was the only power in the world that could use military power to support foreign policy. Starting last fall, uh, uh, oh, we got the second one. So the United States has lost the monopoly on the use of military power in support of foreign policy. Uh, that's fundamental, I think, uh, isn't that something that has not yet, I think, been fully understood in the community, uh, but I would argue that's kind of the biggest thing. Um, our nuclear weapons will remain as a foundation of security, uh, but now we got a more active play, out, a more active play out there, and just uh, maps with uh, uh, the Slickum regions from the Bal uh, from the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, the entire Europe. I would say more importantly, the entire Middle East. Uh, uh, I don't really believe that NATO is the primary target, although of course NATO. Um, military planning will need uh, to, uh, to adjust for that. I think that what's NATO doing now is very like, obsolete uh, like already. <laughs> it doesn't make really much strategic sense. Um, uh, but I think that the main interest is actually the Middle East. Uh, that's the big thing. So is arms control. Well, I think nothing will happen. Really, yes, I fully agree with Pavel here. That's an old deadlock, that's an old difference. In the framework, uh, the United States uh, talks about nuclear weapons. Uh, and Russians want to include everything, one big package, saying that nuclear weapons are just one component of, uh, of security and will need to address uh, other things, uh, like conventional, like missile defense, and space, and quite frankly, as I still don't quite understand what they include into the category of space weapons. Uh, so we got that deadlock. Uh, can we resolve it? Yes, we can. Yes, even uh, the missile defense, I think, can be resolved in a matter of a few months, if you wanted to. Uh, the problem is not the issue itself. Uh, the problem is the domestic politics, mostly in Washington, uh, but in the last five, seven years, increasingly in Moscow as well. So it's really the domestic politics issue. Is, oh, look, it's not uh, it's the missile defense thing itself. For conventional, uh, the game is becoming quite interesting. Until about two, three years ago, very few people in this town inside the Beltway actually believed that Russia uh, could uh, develop these weapons. So now they got them. So should we keep saying that long-range conventional strike capability should not be a subject of talks, or should we now uh, is actually uh, uh, admit that Russians got them too, uh, 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 that Russian uh, capability is not regulated like in any way, not limited like in any meaningful way? Yes, and the only way to do it is to negotiate. I don't know, uh, I'm quite pessimistic, uh, 
uh, but not about the issue once again itself. He's, I'm quite pessimistic about how things are done in Washington inside uh, the Beltway. Uh, so I think that um, uh, when we talk about the agenda for the next administration, these are the hard decisions to make. Do we accept the integrative approach uh, uh, that Russians have been like, advocating for more than 10 years, or we keep the old approach that we only oh, 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 address nuclear weapons? Yes, and that's uh, uh, the fundamental thing that will uh, need to be considered that we need a decision on. And once again, I'm not very optimistic. If we go to specific candidates, I think that under uh, President Clinton, we'll keep exactly the same policy as we have now, and we do not have arms control. <laughs> if we got President Trump, who knows? <laughs> well, anything can happen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nikolai. Um, it's, uh, I'm struck, as I'm sure many of you are, by this interesting dichotomy, right? Uh, Pavel has argued that Russia may not have a nuclear strategy, that Russia builds the force posture that um, defense industry lobbies for, effectively, right? Um, Nikolai has laid out a strategy, but indeed it's not very well matched by the force posture, right? If, um, if Russia had, I mean, I, I really hate the de-escalation terminology because all escalation is in principle to de-escalate. I mean, that's generally why you escalate is to make it stop. Very, very few people escalate with the thought that, ooh, and then they're gonna hit me back harder. Uh, so it's, you know, it's always about de-escalation, but the question of whether Russia has the intent to escalate to nuclear use first as a strategy today, after the 2010 doctrine, uh, is something we've all been debating. But you know, one of the one of the strongest arguments against it is that if that was your strategy, surely you'd be investing in the weapons you would use for it, which would be, on the one hand, non-strategic nuclear weapons. If you really think that you are de-escalating in a local or regional conflict, or perhaps the bomber force, which can be used strategically or non-strategically. Neither of these has actually gotten that much investment with the exception of some of the dual capable um, weaponry that we've seen finally after 20 years uh, rolling off the assembly line. So I mean, I think, I think it is this interesting question of what does Russia actually intend to do? There's its rhetoric, there's the forces it's got, and then there's what you actually think is possible with that combination. Um, and again, I kind of want to come back to the exercises Nikolai mentioned, because what I think is really striking is very rarely do the Russians say there's a nuclear component in these scenarios. Very often, the um, US, you'll get from US and NATO country sources that there was a nuclear component to the exercises, but the Russians almost never say there is. You can find a concurrent nuclear exercise going on along with the conventional one, but those go on a lot. So. If you're trying to build a deterrence posture, if you're trying to point out that this could escalate to nuclear use, wouldn't you be clearer about the fact that there's a nuclear weapon uh, in, in this game? All of which I find um, just, it's fascinating. I, I mean, I draw my own conclusions, which are pretty much that the Russians do take nuclear weapons fairly seriously, that their doctrine is their doctrine, but that they also enjoy the, um, the ambiguity. Uh, and perhaps aren't as smart about when to deploy it as we might want them to be and aren't as clear, but they have noticed just how nervous the United States and uh, various European countries get when they point out their nuclear capability. And while they don't actually plan to use these weapons in the sense of using these weapons, they really enjoy using them in a political sense of making countries nervous. Um, I'm gonna start off the questioning because moderator's prerogative and all that, and I have, um, I have a lot of questions. Um, I, I think um, kind of combining these two talks, um, I think this question is mostly for Pavel, but I would like also to hear Nikolai's thoughts. How well do you sleep with Russia's current uh, early warning capability? I, it, what I find really interesting is that they have very recently finally gotten the ground-based radars pretty much into shape. But the satellite system um, actually got worse in the last couple of years. They're, they're having to rebuild from scratch. 
Is that just a matter of the technology not matching the needs? And if so, why has nobody thought to then adjust other requirements? Right, you've got the system that insists on putting an awful lot on silo-based ICBMs, including a new one, which Pavel described. And if your early warning doesn't work, well, no, you don't have a second strike. Uh, you have a launch on warning. And if you're launching on warning, I don't know, what are you launching at on warning? If you assume that the other guy's missiles have all launched, are you going after command and control? Um, are you going after Warsaw? Um, I, I don't, you know, so I, I think there, there is this really interesting question, um, again, of this disconnect between what the strategy might be and what the weapons mix is. Um, and then for both of you, Two questions on arms control. One is if um, the United States does move forward with missile deployments in Europe, does Russia pull out of New START? Uh, they've said they would. It was part of the Duma ratification of the treaty. Um, and the other piece of it is um, if you go to a hypersonic agreement, if you try to include those in arms control talks, don't you have to then pull in other countries? And how complicated does that get? And will the Russians still be interested? So um, I guess I'll ask Pavel to respond first, then Nikolai, and then we'll turn it to you all for more questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, just uh, very, very quickly uh, on on early warning. Uh, I, I I think I'm okay. I've, I've long been making this argument that uh, we shouldn't really worry that much about Russia's losing its early warning capability, especially the space uh, the space uh, segment, because. Uh, if you look at, uh, and I did actually a paper on that uh, a while back, uh, if, if you look at what what it is the satellites add to Russia's early warning, they don't add very much in terms of the time and uh, capability. So it's not it's not a big deal. Uh, and uh, but uh, why Russia would have early warning and sort of what it is that it is uh, would be trying to hit in the second strike or the launch and warning strike, well, that's an interesting question. I, my, again, as you could see from the uh, data, uh, some of which I also published, the, the Soviet Union and Russia have never had any, any counter force capability to begin with. So they are, they are not targeting silos anyway. So uh, the idea is, again, as I said, this kind of a, as long as they have this kind of a feeling or the, uh, that oh, we can retaliate if we are hit. And then it doesn't matter how many missiles would be able to do that. In fact, uh, again, there is a study done in the 80s uh, that looked at that and they uh, said, well, basically we're okay. Uh, our forces could retaliate and destroy 80 targets, 80, 80 targets on the US territory in the second strike. And that, that was the time when they had, what, like more than 10,000 warheads on each side in the arsenal. So they, perfectly, they were perfectly fine with a few, few targets being hit. So I think that's not, that's not the issue. On, uh, try to be brief. On missile defense in Europe, uh, I don't think Russia will pull out in, uh, I think it is, it has, it is in a much better position uh, politically kind of being in and complaining about the Americans building missile defense and actually doing something in response. Uh, so that, that would be my idea. Because again, as, as I said, uh, you, you, do, you do the math and, uh, and in fact the uh, number of uh, uh, people in Russia, the, the missile designers and uh, I think even generals are on record saying that this system is not good against Russian forces, which it is not. It is not good against Iranian or North Korean, so that what they want. So, and uh, <clears throat> on hypersonic, uh, it's an interesting issue, sort of, do you want to uh, sort of include others like China into the, the fold? Uh, I, uh, I have my serious doubts about the usefulness of this technology, the, but it is getting kind of a, may become a kind of a stumbling block of sorts. Uh, what, I, what I'm specifically what I'm talking about is that, uh, as I understand, the U.S. administration is on record saying that these kind of systems are not limited by New Start because they are not ballistic, and that that was Jim Miller, I think, uh, testified to that. I think that that's that's a mistake because uh, when as the the Russian system may be up 
may reach operational capability in 2018, and the United States will then go and will be convincing everyone that this system should be limited because they are all kind of things. It's much easier to reach this understanding that they are limited by New START because of their missiles or uh, whatever reason, uh, because the numbers will be small anyway and that won't make any difference at all. But that, that would put some kind of a cap. And I, I, I'm not sure Russia would agree actually at this point, but that's, I think, a reasonable thing to do. As for China, well, let's sort of the China people, sort of people who do China <laughs> policy, let them worry about that. <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, fascinating questions, but let me actually start by uh, uh, what you referred to, Olga, uh, about the apparent kind of disconnect between Pavel and myself, posture oh, and strategy. Um, well, that's been around for a very, very, very long time, actually. Uh, uh, what was the Soviet pattern, actually, uh, that Pavel described very well? Uh, so the defense industry really proceeded like, on its own. Yes, I had that experience. Why do you develop this missile? We don't actually need it. Uh, because we can. Uh, so the same thing is really now uh, that we can see. I think that's actually bad. I think that's one biggest negative development uh, that in Russia, defense industry is fundamentally like operating same way like, as it used to in the Soviet Union. Uh, so yes, that's a problem. Um, okay, um, the weapons to use are non-strategic weapons for de-escalation mission. That's one actually point where I do not agree. <laughs> uh, uh, because uh, uh, short-range nuclear weapons are not particularly useful. Well, if you talk about this whole de-escalation concept, uh, is in fact uh, going back to that uh, 2003 document of. Uh, uh, that I referred to in my slides. Uh, uh, well, it was, I think, very, very clear. Uh, the document said that, uh, that Americans will use force from long distances. So, uh, so, so uh, we need to be able to strike at long distances. Why would you need non-strategic nuclear weapons if, for example, uh, NATO flies from Poland, Germany, from the Pacific, uh, from Diego Garcia or something like that, or actually B-2s do fly from the United States. They did uh, so, uh, so, uh, in Afghanistan, for example. Uh, so uh, uh, de-escalation, so uh, limited use is not about limited distances. Uh, limited use is about the number, uh, but the targets are actually the ones the United States will be using, and the United States is mostly using long-range assets. So yes, that's kind of, I think, the answer uh, to that kind of riddle. Uh, why they did not go uh, more kind of visible on simulated nuclear use? Well, I think it's quite, that's quite visible, because like in all uh, the West, for example, series of maneuvers, uh, you did see uh, strategic bombers flying like in simulating the launch of cruise missiles. So I think it was enough, but that's debatable. Um, so missile defense, oh, 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 early warning. Yes, it's going slow. Um, the public statements by the military now say uh, uh, 2022. Well, maybe 2022 the space component will be around. Uh, we don't really know. Uh, delays can happen, but fundamentally, it's just a function of money and time. It was the same as with, uh, uh, with Bulava. Uh, people made a lot out of, of the fact that the program did not actually work. There were failed launches. Um, my perspective from the very beginning was, was eventually they'll figure it out. Um, uh, I think exactly the same about the space component. Uh, finally, um,
bombers. Um, uh, these are like increasingly dual capable. Uh, so we really need to switch to the stockpile. Something that Obama actually said back in 2010, uh, is I had been like, advocating the same thing uh, for like 15 years. Yet I think that's really the way to go. So you separate the stockpile, so uh, that's the nuclear capability. Uh, yes, and you separately like, address uh, the delivery capability that's gonna be uh, uh, dual capable. Uh, so yes, that's the way to go. Uh, that's quite challenging, uh, but my experience is that if you really sit down look at the table and seriously try to negotiate, you can do that. Yes, it's just a matter of political decision. It's a matter of will. Yes, it's a matter of domestic politics. And once again, the domestic politics is the most difficult component ever. All right, thank you. I'm going to open it up uh, to the crowd. Um, and I see a hand right here. I'm going to see if I can take three questions at a time and then uh, go to the speakers to get more in since we don't have a ton of time. Pavel, you mentioned modernization of command and control. Uh, two issues there. Has there been any change in the rather archaic national command authority structure that was inherited from the Soviet times? Um, involving the president and the two military officials. And on the hardware side, has there been any modernization of the perimeter system or of the way command and control is carried out from what we previously knew? Let's uh, take, um, I've got a question back there. Um, Hi, uh, two questions if I might. Uh, uh, has there ever been any Folks could uh, introduce themselves and uh, give an affiliation. Should have said that in the first place. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Tracy Wilson. I'm a uh, consultant here in, in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, two questions for you, if I might. Um, has, has there been any discussion of a Russian version of the nuclear posture re review to help address this mismatch between, between strategy and and uh, stockpile. And then secondly, given the, the dim prospects for arms control in the next few years, uh, what are your thoughts about New START extension uh, and, and other you know, confidence building and transparency measures that might be uh, an option uh, going forward? Let's take uh, one more right up here in front. Aaron Jacobson, Columbia University, SIPA. In the early 2000s, uh, one Russian government official was giving an interview, and he was talking about, in the mix of the Chechen conflict, a certain new weapon that he termed a nuclear scalpel, and which would be a surgical weapon that would be able to very limited uh, strike that would be able to destroy a military target with very few civilian casualties. This has recently been picked up um, in the last two years in the literature, and I was run wondering if there has been any real progress on developing a limited nuclear weapon that would be able to simply destroy nuclear or simply destroy a limited military target with with almost zero other civilian casualties. Okay, um, but you've. Nikolai, you want to go first? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Uh, yes, I just thought that actually <laughs> most of the questions were to Pavel, is particularly about uh, 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 the perimeter. Yes, if I'm sitting next to Pavel, yes, I'd rather actually not touch the perimeter. <laughs> uh, no, seriously. Uh, uh, that arrangement, the president, uh, and our two military figures is quite like, outdated. Um, uh, Alexei Arbatov, by the way, uh, advocated kind of uh, another civilian, like instead of uh, the military, uh, quite recently. Uh, but I have not seen any um, like indications that anything like that is happening. So I think uh, that's really being kept. Um, uh, the technical side is being modernized. We don't really know much about uh, that one. Uh, like extending new starts, sure, why not? 
Uh, basically, new start does not limit anyone. It's just a nice uh, confidence building thing uh, uh, to parade uh, like in front of uh, non-nuclear states. I spent four years in Vienna, actually, well, still working up, up for um, Monterey, but we got like an office there now. Uh, so as I attended great many like, events at the Vienna International Center, uh, the IEA, uh, like in particular, like CDBTO. Uh, uh, so, so, so yes, if you go to say, uh, the NPT PrepCom, uh, a really touching view um, when like all of a sudden, uh, like American and Russian representatives oh, oh, report like, on Article 6. They basically say like, exactly the same words and they praise new start. So the two countries can completely uh, disagree on everything oh, oh, else, but both really uh, talk about new start as a great achievement in nuclear disarmament. Uh, so why not extend it? You know, I really hope that the 10 year term of new start would uh, provide time to move to the new framework to go look ahead and uh, do some really heavy lifting like, in terms of so, uh, the new framework that's not happening. So yes, at some point we'll probably need uh, so, uh, to extend. Uh, start one could not be extended. Yes, absolutely. Um, a nice treaty, I really loved it. Yes, I wrote like a chunk of that treaty, uh, but it was way too cumbersome, very expensive to implement. Uh, these problems were addressed oh, 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 in new start, so it's now oh, oh, extendable. Uh, the scalpel thing kind of, uh, uh, well, it's really hard to tell without context <laughs> what was meant there. Uh, I'll look in the statement that you referred to, uh, probably low yield. Um, uh, the Russian nuclear weapons complex is very much alive and kicking. They've been talking about low yield capability for a long time. What they've done or not done, we actually don't know. I, I would not be surprised at low yield, uh, but the evidence, I, uh, but the hard evidence is uh, not in public domain. Uh, there might be people like in the audience who know that better, but they will probably not talk. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, on on the command control, I actually, I, I would strongly disagree that this system is archaic and uh, outdated. Uh, I, I think it's actually uh, was a res I mean the this whole national command authority when the uh, head of the state whoever it was cannot actually do it on a whim and that there is a procedure and there is a way to uh, there are there are, there are kind of a, uh, checks and balances within that uh, I was reading uh, I think was it Bruce Blair's uh, piece on what uh, President Trump could do to launch a nuclear war. And, and as I understand, uh, there is absolutely no way for the US military to not to follow the order from the president. If the president would decide that just he wants to or she wants to launch uh, the missiles. And that's, uh, I think that's quite dangerous. I mean, people would, may refuse to follow the order, but that's, that's, uh, that's a different territory. In the in the Soviet system, the system was built to deal with the old and frail general secretaries. So they, uh, no, I'm serious. They 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 actually, as as I understand it, I, from my conversations, they they had this thing in mind that they they need to uh, keep uh, keep that. So I think that that's uh, in a, in a way uh, what what I know about the uh, the way the National Command Authority works. I think it's in the command and the the uh, command and control structure in general. I think it's a fairly reasonable uh, reasonable system. The perimeter, uh, yeah, I think as uh, one of the one of the uh, missile divisions, and I think it's in Uria. It's Topol Topol missiles uh, this time. They they are uh, command missiles of the uh, of the uh, perimeter or its follow on. Uh, so and uh, that's. Uh, uh, that's pretty much alive. <clears throat> so on uh, on the discussion of uh, new kind of a, having a nuclear posture view, uh, I, 
it would be nice actually to have a new nuclear posture era. It just doesn't, it's not just like, it's not uh, the way the Russian or the Soviet system works. It, it's, uh, it's quite different. Uh, I think, as, again, uh, there, there are all, all these kind of systems, then they just look at them and say, well, uh, what can we, what we, what can we do with them? Sort of, what, and then there, I mean, they operate sort of within the parameters. There, there were back in the Soviet uh, time. There, there were certain kind of attempts to. Uh, there is, uh, there was a mechanism for at least looking into these issues, and actually in the. Uh, in, in the Russian experience, in, uh, as I understand, in uh, 98, uh, there was actually a commission uh, that, uh, with academicians and sort of that looked into uh, how, you, how do you build uh, strategic nuclear forces. And this is where they decided to build Bulava, they built uh, the uh, build older. RS-29M missiles, and that, that was that was actually a very positive experience. But that, again, this is not how the system works these days, uh, unfortunately. Uh, on uh, New START, uh, very briefly, uh, I think, yes, uh, as I suggested, uh, I think that's something that we can or should actually do, just change the number. And in my view, Basically, uh, New Start uh, is uh, here. I disagree, uh, maybe with uh, uh, Nikolai a little bit. Uh, I think New Start is a good treaty in that it provides a workable framework for for a very deep reductions. And actually, uh, I would totally welcome uh, the New Start treaty with zero in it, and it can be done. And it's, uh, I mean, it will not have the total nuclear disarmament, of course, but you can. Imagine that New START treaty with zero deployed warheads, and that's, uh, I think that would be a good thing. On this nuclear scalpel, I would very much doubt that this is, a, this is a something, uh, something a, a, of an active program. So I, I just, uh, I don't have much of a kind of hard information, but my hunch is that I don't see how the people would be excited and would be working on something like that. I just, uh, uh, again, this is not how the system works. I can just add very quickly on the scalpels. I, I tried to uh, hunt it down, and um, what I found was I could not find any mention of it that didn't date back to more than a decade, and that didn't date back to Viktor Mihailov, who died a few years back. Uh, so I. There are people who get very excited about low-yield nuclear weapons in both Russia and the United States who would love the opportunity to develop them and possibly use them. Um, luckily, the most, pe most of those people work for saner people, so it doesn't end up happening. Um, so, uh -huh. uh, yes, yeah, just about the statements. Yes, you need a grain of salt there uh, when people uh, begin to blubber. Yes, and that actually happens. Uh, more often than you might suspect, and I just, uh, uh, going back to perimeter, yes, I remember uh, talking to one general, well, it was over a few drinks, more than a few drinks, um, who basically said, yeah, that's a great thing, actually, like this whole new system, uh, because we can uh, keep drinking, yes, and the computer will just wage nuclear war. Um, yeah, I would not actually take that as like an informed, balanced the opinion of how the perimeter actually works. Uh, let's take a few more. Um, why don't we go up front here? Uh, the woman in the white. Hi, uh, I'm Kara. I'm from the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies here in DC, actually. Um, and so you mentioned that um, you know, historically, Russians like nukes, right? So in that vein, what is the, how do you see the security culture in Russia? And how, how does Russia's view of nuclear power affect um, how the nukes are developed and how they're kept safe and how that might have a greater effect on like Russian strategy overall? Let's take a couple more. Uh, let's uh, gentlemen right behind you. 
Thank you very much for your insight today. My name is Joe Cicero. I work for Peace Action, formerly Sane Freeze. Um, my question is two part. Number one, uh, you, you described the Russian modernization program as a normal generational type change. In taking a look at the American uh, nuclear weapon modernization that's on the table, uh, would you, how would you describe that? Is it somewhat similar or is it drastically different? Number two, specifically, the uh, new nuclear cruise missile, L LSRO, uh, Senator Boxer calls it destabilizing um, and obviously uh, a bad idea. The, I want to know is the Russian perspective on the LRSO, especially the fact that the warhead is adjustable and do they have a, a similar thing in the works or uh, is it something that really bothers them? And uh, let's check one more. It's Jeff. Thanks. Uh, Jeff Mankoff with CSIS. Um, I guess this is mostly a question for Nikolai, but in addition to the differing perspectives on what the next step of um, disarmament should be the in Russian integrated approach versus the U.S. focus specifically on nuclear weapons. One of the other issues that I've heard come up is the role of third powers, um, especially China, and this in part centers on the fact that the estimates for the numbers of warheads that China possesses that I've heard from Russian and American sources is quite different. Um, so could you talk a little bit about how perspectives on the role of third powers, especially China, might figure into the next generation of disarmament talks? Uh, Pavel, you want to go first this time? Okay. Uh, you're, you, you're, you're asking about security culture as a nuclear security? Oh, th this is a very, <laughs> very difficult subject. It doesn't, uh, I, I just, uh, I'll leave it to Nikolai, but I, I would just note that the what's interesting is that the nuclear complex, the nuclear weapons, and uh, that that was the nuclear power uh, complex as well. Uh, they been traditionally very separate from the rest of the defense industry, and that uh, so they have their own role. They have their own uh, power sources, and they. Uh, they, in fact, they don't quite fit into this kind of a model of interaction between uh, the uh, defense industry and the polit pol political leadership that I described. That uh, So it's a, it's a kind of a universe of its own. It's a very interesting universe, but uh, let, let me just stop uh, here. We could, we could talk about it. That's a, it's a really fascinating subject. Uh, on the uh, the normal generational change in the United States, uh, I think, uh, well, uh, that's, uh, in a way, one of the problems that we've, we, we have in the U.S.-Russian and back in the U.S.-Soviet relationship is that their kind of development cycles are kind of in uh, uh, what they counter, uh, counter face. Uh, so now we are in the, or almost in the, in the period when the, uh, the American politicians, experts, whoever wants to pick up the subject is saying, oh, you see, the Russians are rebuilding their kind of arsenals and we are doing nothing. So uh, I'm sure 10 years down the road, uh, if the, all the Russians will say, oh, you see, the Americans are rebuilding their arsenals and we are doing nothing. So that's, uh, I think, as long as we are, kind of, uh, we understand that, uh, we, we could try to deal with that. Uh, there, is a, there is a very good observation that uh, has been made a number of times by the uh, Russian and Soviet negotiators, and I'm sure uh, <laughs> Nikolai knows uh, all about it, that uh, if you look at the history of arms control, and I'm getting to this the cruise missile thing, uh, if you look at the history of arms control, uh, you see that actually on any particular issue, the positions of the United States and the, the, uh, and the Soviet Union and Russia are identical. The only problem that they are, they exist in different time. <laughs> so, so at the time, if you uh, take the, uh, 
cruise missiles, for example. I mean, back in the 80s, it was the U.S. Navy that said, no way, we, we should we cannot possibly have any limits on silicons and sea launch missiles. Okay, now you will see caliber and everything, and I'm sure that the in the uh, next uh, few years uh, that will be. Uh, right now, actually, people are saying that well, the cruise missiles, referring into the uh, air launch missile, uh, is the most dangerous uh, kind of invention of all time. Well, I mean. Yeah, it, it has its problems. There is no way around that. I think uh, something that I, I didn't have time to talk about that Olga actually did touch, I, I think it is a dangerous development uh, on both sides uh, in, in that these cruise missiles, they are dual capable. There is a significant uncertainty about uh, whether they are nuclear or not. And uh, that's, uh, that's something that we will have to deal uh, with uh, down, down the road. Unfortunately, I think this uh, train le has left the station in a way that Russia has already built its systems. I don't believe that the opposition to this, to the LRSO in the United States would be successful in shutting down the program, given that Russia is already there. Uh, I think it is unfortunate development, but that's, that's where we are. Uh, on, on third countries, I, I would just add, just very briefly, that uh, I think it's pretty much a, a smokescreen. I think Russia, Russia very much, in my view, Russia very much likes its kind of a privileged position at being the only partner with the United States uh, on these matters, the arms control and strategic arms control. So uh, I don't think they would actually really want to have China on the table. So I, I, I think it's, uh, it's a red right herring. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, and thank you, Pavel. You actually made my job much easier. <laughs> uh, on nuclear security, uh, yes, I agree with everything that Pavel has said. Um, uh, when it comes to the nuclear stockpile, that's pretty safe, that's very secure. Uh, I frankly do not have any problems with that. Uh, just as a note, a couple of years ago I wrote a big chapter for a book that was edited by Henry Sokolsky about nuclear crisis, also when kind of control of nuclear weapons could be lost. Uh, so, you, so as I did, uh, uh, the Soviet slash uh, 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 the Russian case, and I actually talk a lot about um, uh, 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 the security of nuclear stockpile. Uh, so fundamentally, uh, these people in uniform, uh, the 12th uh, GUMO were kind of uh, the main reason why we did not have uh, uh, the nuclear stockpile of the Soviet Union really like, fall apart and so, uh, taken to kind of uh, so, uh, to national kind of quarters. Um, on posture of the generation change, yes, I exactly agree with what Pavel said. I think. Uh, yeah, so um, we had this like disconnect in cycles uh, throughout the Cold War, and I would say that uh, the saddest post-Cold War thing is that we have seen it reemerged. Uh, uh, yes, that's one of the things uh, that does actually fuel uh, oh, oh, R&D. Uh, uh, it does create a very negative political climate. Um, so yes, I do believe that the United States will actually go on uh, with the uh, um, uh, 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 the replacement uh, of main platforms and delivery vehicles. Um, well, basically, no matter what, um, and without actually much regard to what could have been done differently. Said, but uh, yeah, I don't think that we can avoid that. On the new cruise missile, uh, yes, Russia does have a new uh, long-range Alcom. So basically, the United States is going to be stuck with that. I think. Yes, I share what Pavel said. Uh, uh, third powers. I think I slightly disagree with Pavel here, and um, not 100 percent, but somewhat. Uh, so the official Russian position today is that already the next stage of reduction, so beyond a new start, should be um, um, multilateral uh, in some shape and form. Uh, they don't divide. So, 
I'll define how. The U.S. position is that we can still do one round of reductions bilaterally, yes, and then we can go multilateral once again, uh, not define exactly how uh, we do that. Uh, one, uh, whether we can actually uh, still do uh, the next round bilaterally is very much uh, debatable. We probably can. That's a matter uh, to negotiate between the United States and Russia. Uh, yes, I think that Russia can actually uh, change its current position if it got any reasons to change it, right? Second, I'm not really sure that we talk about uh, including uh, third countries into something like New START or like another treaty. I think that at least for the beginning, yes, and that's kind of, like if you try to read between lines, uh, like I think, uh, look at first, it's not really like about uh, doing a multilateral treaty, but maybe providing uh, more transparency, um, more predictability about the nuclear capabilities of other countries, uh, yes, China in particular. So more about freeze than like about oh, 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 reductions, inspections, and all the fun things. Um, and finally, uh, one look, issue that, quite frankly, no one knows how to resolve is what you do with uh, unofficial nuclear states, uh, those that are not listed in uh, the NPT, and we actually don't have a handle on how you address uh, these nuclear capabilities. Yet I'm not talking about even North Korea. That's just hopeless, really, to kind of address. Uh, but even talk about like India and Pakistan. Uh, that's not easy, and if you look at the capabilities, if you just look, look at missile ranges and everything, by the way, look, all of them reach Russia. Uh, uh, so yes, as soon as we bilaterally go below some kind of level, okay, say 1,000, we will have uh, uh, this problem, this challenge, we'll face it, uh, First hand, that actually will become uh, the top priority for any future arms control measures mm -hmm. and maybe for modernization. Thank you. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, I thought this was really a fantastic discussion. I uh, would like to ask you all to join me in thanking our speakers. Um, and and thank you all for being here. Thank you.